Thanks, Pushka. Yeah, Pushka is a, a great member of our community. He's worked on um, a lot of the stuff that you, you see today in our presentation. Cool. So let's get started. Yeah, we got somewhat of a contentious title, Creating Cloud Native Security. What do we mean by that? Isn't cloud native by definition intrinsically secure or meant to be? We're going to talk through the slides and during the presentation, what do we actually mean for creating cloud native security? How, how to do open source security in public, working in public, advancing the space, safeguarding the systems upon which we run critical applications and mitigating the structural risk as a whole. Brandon? Yeah, so today we're going to um, quickly go through, you know, um, who we are, how we're doing the things that, you know, Andrew said, uh, how we're going to secure our cloud native security, build the whole thing, um, and also like how we're doing it, which is very important, and which like we're collaborating with many different groups, both security and as almost as importantly, the non-security groups. Um, so we're going to start off a little bit about talking about us. Um, so who are we? We are the CNCF Tag Security, um, and the Tags initially renamed from SIG Security, uh, existed as part of the Technical Oversight Committee or the TOC of the CNCF. Uh, essentially, um, you can think about the Tags as kind of extensions, like ARM extensions of the TOC in order to kind of help um, you know, educate and to be able to help drive the technical decisions of the TOC. Um, so our main, our main scope of work, our main charter is really uh, create cognitive security with essentially the goal of balancing the whole protection versus um, usability, right? That's the age old question with security. Um, we concentrate a lot on common tooling. And I think this is a very essential part of, we are given this um, gift of having a green field with cloud native and we want to make sure that we build everything together as a community, we have common tooling, we have common auditability uh, methods and so on. Our so, charter, just to add, informs everything we do. It informs how we engage, it informs our strategy. You, you've seen the cloud native ecosystem uh, the interactive page where it has all these projects, a good chunk of those are security solutions. And there's no clear interface or boundary between many of these. Uh, the space and the problem domain is, is quite broad. There is a number of, of sharp tools out there. And we work with, with all these different projects. Uh, we prioritize work based on incoming requests from the TOC and the community. So we jump onto different projects. We do look out for common tooling. And part of it is, well, the, the problem is challenging because a lot of the getting started on the technologies is a high barrier of entry. These are very complex expert level systems and there's not a lot of documentation. The maintainers may have a very good understanding of the failure modes, of the security boundaries, of the execution paths, but these are typically not well documented. So we do fill in for quite a bit of that and around it, well, we are, we're trying to fill in those blanks. Yep. And in order to fill in all these blanks, uh, we essentially as a community are not just security professionals. We work with developers, the DevOps, the ops folks, the managers, engineering managers, and also folks that you know are coming in new to security because we are building all this for them and not for us. So we are largely community-based. We believe that this has been a successful model so far. All issues, all the PRs, all the efforts mostly have been driven by um, the members and participants of the community. And right now we are almost, I think, or at least over 100 members and we come from 60 different companies. If I could get a show of hands, members of the tag who are here in the room with us. Awesome, pretty good turnout. Some of you are security engineers. Some of you are 
practitioners. I see some product managers in the room. I see some tech writers. So we're a diverse group of folks. Uh, there's work for everyone. And there's, there's many ways to get in, involved. And we're going to talk through those. But yeah, part of that is, is democratizing security, making it accessible. So over time and, and the two, three years of existence of the technical advisory group, we have been very focused on outputs and artifacts. The way we work is proven successful by recent publications that have been quite timely. We have the cloud native security map. We have the cloud native security landscape. We have the secure software supply chain best practices. We have a reference architecture that is in the works. We have a number of other security resources, cloud native eight, uh, eight guiding principles for building security from the ground up that is currently open for review. We're going to make some of these links available for posterity. We want to get as many eyes as we want on it. A lot of it is departing from security by obscurity. You can see a list here of a few other things. Uh, well, the personas, the supply chain catalog, we're going to show different samples of these. Awesome. So one of the things that uh, was initially our focus area within, um, this was back I think a year and a half to almost two years now, was the cloud native security white paper. And essentially the whole idea of this it was that we got a lot of people coming to us that were like, I don't really understand what cloud native security is. How is it different from regular security, traditional security? Folks that are moving from on-prem VMs to containers are like, What's different of this? What is DevOps? How do I use it? Um, and essentially, we got together and we built the Cloud Native Security White Paper. So what uh, the White Paper is, is it first defines what is Cloud Native Security. Why is Cloud Native Security um, you know, different enough for us to write a white paper, a white paper just about it? Um, talking about the essential uh, tenants and the methodology of Cloud Native and how security has to evolve to adapt to them. Um, so we go all the way from like develop, distribute, um, to all the way to runtime, going from how do I develop my application, uh, how do I do the checks, how do I publish these artifacts in, in a cloud native ecosystem, uh, to how do I consume and use these different artifacts. And then we, we talk a little bit about high assurance, um, things which are a bit more popular uh, in cloud native deployments, such as zero trust, right? Uh, now that essentially we are able um, to, to create the Kubernetes platforms or different container platforms on top of infrastructure, how do we establish trust between the different islands? And we talk a little bit about compliance in terms of how it also uh, affects different regulation, regulatory industries like finance, um, financial, and federal. Um, one, one cool thing is that this white paper has been very useful. We, um, we'll talk a bit about later. We've got some really good feedback uh, that drives some of the work that we're doing. Uh, in fact, this, this white paper wanted to be used um, by, I think, in Brazil. And uh, in Brazil, there's a policy that you can only use some, uh, a document for government contracts if it's written in Portuguese. <laughs> So we do have a couple of folks that are translating in this into Portuguese. Uh, I think we also have it, it's already translated in simplified Chinese, and we have a couple that are ongoing. Um, obviously, we also are going to adapt to some of the new things that are coming in. Uh, we are planning on a version two white paper, um, you know, with the EOs coming in, um, with NIST publishing the SSDF paper, which has been, um, I think it's on public command last week. Uh, we'll be looking at that and perhaps thinking about how we are going to close some gaps that you know, are mentioned in the paper. Part of the intent here is I personally come to KubeCon and I get super excited for a lot of what I see and I tend to grasp it typically really quick, but I get back to work the following week and I struggle to be able to explain it to anyone else in my team. Particularly so if there are other security folks and like, let's not even talk about risk people. So the idea here is to empower individuals with a toolkit 
where they can become conversant and help articulate the value prop of security back to the organization and just get through those challenges of, of working with the different stakeholders. Yep. And so another thing that we've done here, and this was a follow-up from the white paper, is something we call the Cloud Native Security Map. And the idea behind the Cloud Native Security Map is to create a, a way um, or, or you know, an interactive way for folks that are coming in to have a bit more practical uh, guidance on things in the white paper, right? In the white paper, we talk about general concepts. Oh, you need to sign your things. You need to verify them. Uh, you need to check the provenance of your, your containers and configure your runtime. But you know, it doesn't talk about specific technologies. How do I actually go about doing this? So the Cloud Native Security Map is an interactive um, page, and it's actually hosted at this website. Um, it's live. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on mobile, so don't try that. Uh, but the idea is you can navigate uh, into the white paper and look at, okay, I'm interested as, you know, you have to start security somewhere, right? So evaluating within your organization, maybe I'll start with uh, container image provenance, right? So I go into uh, development, I'll go into container image um, um, signing and provenance, and then it will tell me basically, you know, here are the tools that uh, I can use to go ahead with that. So it will talk about in total, it will talk about uh, things like um, six or things, um, basically all the bunch of different tools and some general guiding principles around that. Another uh, version two that we have on this security map is to come up with something we call guided tours. Uh, this is still a work in progress, it's about to start. The idea behind this is we want to define really um, what are certain tangible stories that people can take and start adopting. So let's say my, my boss goes to me and says, we need to do supply chain supply chain security, right? So we will have a guided tour that says, okay, here is how you go about doing supply chain security. Here is how you're go, going to go about doing runtime security, um, doing risk management, things like that. So these guided tours will basically provide the connections between the different parts of the white paper uh, and to put it in context of a specific technology. And, and we recognize those journeys are typically a progression it maps a little bit to a crawl, walk, run almost. There's a process of discovery, there's a process of developing a better understanding from there going to a place where you can do architectural reviews and design reviews of these technologies uh, to where you can make it part of, of your infrastructure topologies. So we're trying to incorporate that progression of, of adoption of a, of a technology so it's not just you go from zero to like full-blown web scale prod, but it's gradual. It's a little bit of a couch to 5K program for security. So another, another project that we wanna highlight here is something called the Supply Chain Catalog. And this was put into place to kind of address uh, and help folks understand and also um, show the importance of su supply chain security. Uh, this catalog contains all, well, most of the supply chain security breaches over the past few years, and it's a good resource to kind of learn about the different types of supply chain security um, in the real world, in the wild, and also as a way to kind of convince um, stakeholders and high level executives that supply chain is indeed, you know, something that's gonna put you in the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. Um, one thing I'd like to mention about this piece of work, which um, I think this was really cool because this stemmed from a single contributor that was like, I want to do this. It was a maintainer of Intoto Santiago and basically said, I want to do this. He proposed it to the tech. We said, cool, this is aligned with what we want to do as a community. We did it, a bunch of people got on. Now this is our living document. It's in GitHub. You know, if you find a new supply chain, something gets released, supply chain vulnerability, um, not vulnerability, supply chain breach, uh, you can go ahead, um, you can go in and just create a PR to add it to the list. One of our other work streams, uh, very much tied to secure supply chain has been producing a codified, what are the recommended practices? If, if you look at what are the entire set of controls 
map to risk profiles. If you are reasoning about a set of workloads that are not top secret, but should still be secured, and you require like a variance between, there's a differential between the guarantees, well, what are those different levels? And how do you implement those in? Do you have a question? Oh, I saw you raising your arm. So we, we produced and, and published uh, the best practices uh, white paper. This was led by Jonathan Meadows, head of cyber at City, collaboration with myself. We had uh, about 15 to 20 other people who contributed and collaborated to this effort. There's a recording from KubeCon Europe where we talk about and go through, through the different uh, aspects of the white paper. We have progressed from there of, well, now that we have described a software factory end-to-end -end that incorporates security from the ground up, how do we translate that into an architecture that pieces all the different components that you can use as a reference? This is being developed with, I see a number of folks in the room, Marina Moore, Cole Kennedy, driving a lot of the work of, well, if you're reasoning about uh, reproducible builds, what's the relationship of that to like cryptographic identity? And these are things that we typically don't see the relevance from one to the other, but as, look, as you look into the bigger picture, you need the different moving parts. As someone said yesterday, you could have all the parts that make up a piano, but if they're not assembled together right, you can't actually play it. So it is that effort of like how to build the software factory with Yes, paying a lot of attention to the assembly line, but ensuring that, well, the, the access point, the entry of physical security of the different layers of it are also commercially secured, that, that they're watertight. Uh, we are going to be opening it up for public comment in the coming weeks, and from there, then we intend to uh, start writing some code so pe people could check, check it out and run a, a sample of that software factory and start building around it and on top of it. Brandon, if you want to add something to that. Yeah, I think this is, this is something that really we want to, as a community, show people that this is something that it's attainable. It's something that, you know, if you put a bit of effort in this, and I think, you know, Michael showed this, a few others are showing this, there's a lot of projects that are out there that can help you attain, you know, reasonable levels of supply chain security. There are gaps that need to be filled, but uh, we think that you know by showing this to others, they'll follow suit and be able to say that this is a reachable goal. Let's start adopting it in, in our organization. You probably have heard a lot of salsa this week. This factors in salsa. It it factors uh, different risk profiles, different security guarantees. What are the compensating controls? So it is very much attainable. Uh, we're trying not to be overly prescriptive and say, well, at the current time, these are the most mature or fit feature complete technologies in our ecosystem that you can piece together to accomplish this. But we're also trying to provide alternatives and say, well, you could very well do this with Tecton Chains or you could do it with Jenkins X as an example. Cool. So we talked a little bit about, you know, what are some artifacts that we produce as a group. Um, and I want to spend a bit of time, um, you know, before we talk about how to contribute about some of the things we do, you know, not necessarily things that end up in papers, but things we do to help um, strengthen the security of the ecosystem um, and how we work together with other groups. Um, so, big part of cloud native security and creating it is uh, education and partnership. Uh, this largely comes in the form of engagement with different projects and communities. Um, so, an example of that, uh, strengthening um, the ecosystem in CNCF, we have something that we introduced earlier called um, Security Pals. Right. The idea is that someone, um, especially with new projects that are coming, coming into CNCF as you know, sandboxing or incubating, uh, we will have someone there to guide them to talk about, okay, what are, here are, the, what are the security considerations you should integrate from the start, right? Security is something that you should keep in mind from the start and not you know, an afterthought. 
So that is something that we're piloting. Um, it's going great. We almost have uh, our first projects done with that. Um, we also have a um, something that else that we do is uh, security assessment and joint reviews. Uh, this essentially is uh, you know looking at the other CNCF projects and assessing the security posture of it. I won't go into too much detail because Andrews will cover that in the next slide. Um, and of course, you know, we work with a lot of the related group, OpenSSF, obviously, um, Salsa for supply chain stuff. Uh, we work with the Kubernetes 6 security group. Um, we have, there's a lot of overlap with the members and this is great because, you know, um, we call each other out and also we, we want to make sure that, you know, we set realistic goals and make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and then that for our members, we usually have uh, presentations. This go from um, presentations of projects in CNCF around security. Recently, we had like Curie Defense, uh, Kyvern, or you know, new projects coming into the CNCF um, so that folks can get updated with it. And also, we have um, certain talks around like threat model, uh, you know, uh, behavioral security, how you manage security in organization, and things like that. Cool. So do you want to talk about security assessments? Yes, I'll tell you about security assessments, but I'll start off to tell you my ex an anecdote, really, of how I got involved in, in security assessments. I was working in the Spiffy Inspire projects. Shout out to the team, I see them here in the front seat. And the project, the project was at sandbox stage, and we were pursuing, uh, trying to get to incubation and performing that due diligence and security audits, security reviews were one of the requirements we would have to meet in order to make that progression. And the project had actually been uh, scrutinized and reviewed and thread modeled. And I quite didn't understand why would we have to like do this over again and put it in a particular template format. And it seemed a lot like an inconvenience of, well, we're, we're security experts, we know what we're doing, our technology is battle tested, it runs in production. I don't think we're gonna do, extract much value of it and it's more something we just need to get done. Now, we got engaged through, first off, being able to, in order to kick off an assessment, you have to produce a self-assessment. And you need to explain to the technical advisory group, the design of your project, the thread model of your project, the different security attributes of it. And from there on, folks, the reviewers start poking holes. And this engagement typically lasts between a month or, or two months. Well, it's about 10 to 20 hours over the course of, of this period of time. After we completed that, uh, we actually not only got a better ability of how we talked about the security and value prop of our projects. We were also left with a great artifact that helped us gain a broader reach because one of the typical bottlenecks when we were helping organizations trying to adopt Spire was a platform engineer would get it, some security engineer, engineer would get it, but when they had to deal with InfoSec as part of a, of a review in order to get to production, they always had to call Evan Gilman or Andrew Harding or myself to thread model the project live. So now we had a document sanctioned by the CNCF that would help us speed through this review and would actually shorten the time to get to production. Because yes, we can come up with an idea, we can check out the code, we can deploy it to uh, some cloud environment, but in order to get to production, the biggest gate remains to be going through a security review, going through a third party audit. And now we have something that drastically accelerated uh, actually getting there and having those folks satisfied with defensible arguments. So it codifies a lot of that. Since that, I've participated in leading. I, I felt I had to pay it back, and this is how I got involved with tax security, is we extracted so much from this, I wanna help other projects in this, in this journey. I led the security assessment for Harbor, it is published. Also the assessment for BuildPacks, 
Brandon, you've done a few others. You're actually the reviewer for our, yes. this 50 Inspire <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so this is security assessments and reviews, you know, are, are something that we've done way back. Um, a lot of the projects that come to us say that they, they like it. It gives them like interested, like a document to point to. Um, and also it provides kind of like a boost of confidence with the TOC as well, um, in terms of doing due diligence. Uh, we are slowly working to like integrate this into the graduation process. Um, obviously that's always changing, so we're finding the right place for it. But uh, this has some, been something that the TOC has always um, advocated and we will continue to do so. Uh, I want to underline the word confidence is not just confidence for the different stakeholders, but even for the project team, for the maintainers. Because oftentimes we suffer from, our, from imposter syndrome and until you actually restate assumptions and look at your code base and say, oh, we're actually doing signed binaries and we're actually following the set of secure software development best practices. So part of the assessment is actually filling out the rubric for the core infrastructure best practices batch. And it was a huge boost for all those different projects that have gone through the process because, well, we understand how we stack rank against it. Uh, we actually do quite a bit of it or we don't do this much, but here are, are all the other directions that we could do that are gonna give our end users trust, are, are gonna make us more trustworthy and we're, again, better equipping them to take this places at their respective uh, jobs. So yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's yeah. all I have to say about security reviews. Yeah, I think that the last thing I may add is like, um, for projects that may want to get a official security audit, like a KR53 trail bits type audit, uh, is helpful also um, to go to us. We can do an assessment and then we can also make a recommendation to the, the CNCF TOC that this is a security critical project. We think that it should be audited and we should buy an audit for it. Yeah, in our experience working with Q53, Q53 always gives praise because it actually helps them come up to speed much faster. So you're gonna be able to take more advantage, better use of the professional third-party audit that the CNCF pays for. Once you've done the prep work, produce the information, it's only gonna expedite the process and I'm gonna give them more to work with. Cool. So I think the last thing that we wanted to talk about today, just in terms of what we do, is microsurveys um, or surveys in general. Um, this is something we do to kind of keep a pulse on, you know, what's happening outside the end users, you know, outside the security bubble. What do people think about that from the outside? Uh, what are some things we can work on as well as to, you know, go back to the TLC and say that, okay, here is kind of a constant pulse of what's happening and how we're trying to address it. Um, so we did this, um, we did the Cloud Native Security White Paper survey to kind of get people's feedback on, you know, after understanding Cloud Native, what do you think is lacking? What do you think we can work on? You know, the results of the survey said that secure defaults was number one. Um, and then we had the um, Cloud Native 8, which was talking about secure defaults that Pushkar was working on, uh, which is up for public comment, by the way. So please take a look at it. All the feedback is valuable. Um, and then based on that, uh, just recently, a couple of months ago, we, we started on the Cloud Native Micro Survey. And this survey was talking about what are the challenges of organizations today? What are they worried about? Uh, and we, we see a lot of interesting data. Uh, we saw that, you know, obviously supply chain is a big issue, but actually not far too behind of supply chain. You know, vulnerability management was like 10% behind supply chain. Um, secret management was another one. Uh, we talked about where organizations saw that there was a gap in open source. So this was around like secret management, um, you know, vault kind of stuff. Um, HSM alternatives, there were, not, there were no HSM alternatives that people were kind of looking for uh, in terms of um, trying to use them in their organization. Um, and then part of these surveys also, we, we think a little bit um, kind of ahead to things like itch and 5G. We kind of ask people what their concerns are and they kind of look pretty much the same as what, what, um, 
uh, what the regular concerns are with an addition on uh, detecting suspicious behavior because you know all these devices are in places where uh, there is physical access. Cool. Um, so, Andres, do you want to talk about a little bit about where you can jump in? Yeah, I think we're coming up in time, but there's plenty of ways to get involved. It is a collaborative effort. Security is, is a huge responsibility, but look to your right, look to your left. This, this is a good chunk of the people in the world who are entrusted with it. On mitigating, like, the pervasive attacks we, we keep on seeing, that it's mind-boggling that, that these things continue to occur when technology is available, we just haven't productionized it well enough. So we have a mailing list, click on it, sign up, stay in the loop of our different communications, come to our GitHub repository. We do our best to triage issues, uh, what's low hanging fruit, what's a good first issue, what areas are we looking for help. We meet weekly every Wednesday over Zoom. Uh, Cameron Cedar is regu regularly on the calls. Uh, you can ask him and uh, see how, how we work there. Uh, come join us. We have calls for the different working groups. The supply chain call happens every Thursday. Come to our Slack channel. If you, if you don't want to get super, like jump in into the deep, uh, a good glimpse is our roadmap. We have a project board on GitHub that will give you a good sense what initiatives are at play, what things are in our radar that, that we're planning for, what things uh, are we being asked for, but we're, we haven't actually quite gotten into. So there's plenty of ways to get involved. If you don't see something that is immediately interesting, but and you have ideas, propose. Uh, if you are particularly passionate about something that you think we, we have overlooked, we'd love to hear what, what's on your mind. We would, we would love to collaborate with you on how to engage others uh, who are looking to participate and well, help us continue to secure and safeguard the cloud native e ecosystem. With that, uh, before I, I walked in, and to the room, I, I had a huge confidence boost from Cole Kennedy, who has a little bit of, of a recent participation, but I'm trying to paraphrase what you said, but if we could hand him a mic and, and share what you said. So it's just not me trying to tell you the virtuosity of tax security, but if you could share a little bit of your experience. Yeah, so I uh, first got involved with tech security through some of the work I was doing Spiffy Spire, presented, not presented, but kind of talked about that a little bit, um, actually last year at KubeCon through the CNCF Slack. And from that moment on, right, I just felt like a, the, the big hug from, from the SIG security. Um, and, you know, my clients that I was working with at the time when the solar winds happened were, were really affected by it, right? It's, it's a serious issue. And so I, the first thing I did was, you know, we didn't have the expertise, you know, to, to deal with that. It's a really big problem. So I went to SIG security and started working with them. And it really, um, you know, Andres, you know, brought me in. He actually co-authored a uh, article that we posted on our company blog, and he was working for VMware at the time. So not only, you know, did I feel that personal hug, right? He also helped, you know, my company uh, deliver value to our customer, which she didn't need to do, right? It's a community effort. But what SIG security can do, or take, the security tag can do for you is both, you know, elevate not only you on a personal level, right, by including you, um, but also on a, on a business aspect, right? Um, you have some of the greatest security experts in the world um, ready to answer like any questions that you want. And, and that's a really powerful tool to use to help you know, your customers and your initiatives that you have within your organization to ensure that you're more secure. And, and the best part about it is, is that when you do get involved, when you come to places like KubeCon, right? You know, there's not, hasn't been one dull moment here. You know, I've been invited to dinners every single night I've been here. I don't know how many uh, hugs I got from Pop and bananas. Uh, so, you know, it's just if you have issues with your cloud native deployments or questions from your regulators about the security, 
come in and, and ask your questions. I, I promise you'll be welcome uh, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. We're, we're available to your disposal. Consider, consider us your, your security friends. Yeah, and just like uh, uh, a reminder again, like, you know, we drive everything to GitHub, um, very community focused, again, you know, open to whether you're someone that's new to security, you're someone that wants to, that's keen to learn. Our community is very friendly. Uh, you know, we, we need folks like uh, all types of folks to kind of give the different perspectives and, um, and ideas. And yeah, uh, we, as the leadership team, the, the co-chairs and the TLs are always open to your DM. So like message us or just um, ping us on the Slack channel. Yeah. What questions or feedback do you all have for us? This is our mascot, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? One in the back? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Um, what are your uh, thoughts uh, on like getting a pen test, um, you know, traditionally done um, on your servers to, to test your security on in the context of Kubernetes and uh, like uh, um, clusters? Is it uh, something that's viable, worth considering? I'm going to try to say back to you what I understand your question is. Do we conduct pen tests? And if not, is it something we could be doing? Just, yeah, just your opinions on it. Uh, like, if it's good practice, if it's... If it's for, doing for doing pet, pen tests? Absolutely. You, you want to stress test systems, right? You want to measure them for their resiliency and, and how fragile they are and understand which different ways can they break. A lot of what we do with the security audit is produce the information that will inform pen testers. So. We talked about the third-party security audit that CNCF uh, gives as a service to, to the projects. I don't know if it's something that they're going to be doing with the new credits program, but a few different of the projects have been involved. They put in a very sophisticated crew of individuals uh, to black box attack uh, your project. I know the gentleman here in front recently went through one of those. I don't know if you'd mind saying a word or two about that. I'll, I'll pass the microphone up here. Great question, thank you. Thanks, Andres. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so our projects went through, I wouldn't quite call it penetration test, but it was the Cure 53 security audit that was referred to earlier. Um, it was like uh, halfway kind of, I guess it was halfway between white box and black box. Um, but it's one of the <clears throat> benefits of being incubation and, and above a uh, project in CNCF is that you're able to do this audit and the CNCF will cover cost. Our experience going through that process was actually very good and those folks knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, they uncovered a few pretty nasty things that we were able to respond to quickly, luckily, but we learned a lot in that process and it was hugely, hugely valuable, probably one of the most valuable um, security review processes we've gone through. And so. You know, my, I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what, what you're referring to it with the pen testing. You know, I, I know that there are different opinions on the effectiveness of, of, of like live pen testing on production environments, but the, exa the, the experience that we had going through CNCS sponsored security review was, was second to none, and um, I cannot recommend it high enough. Yeah, there's, there's actually, thank you, Evan, for that. That's very insightful. There's, there's one distinction in there of the usefulness of, of a pen test of, of a runtime system. And when we talk about uh, the ephemerality of things and like systems that should be immutable, like that there shouldn't be any runtime drift, like arguably, well, a pen test would, would be like poking a little bit into those wounds if, if those things are not there, but it can surface additional information. The audit is a little bit more like not in production uh, to say, but yeah. All right. So I love the enthusiasm, but we are out of time. <laughs> so I request everyone to go and chat with any of the tax security members, including me, on the hallway. Thank you, Brandon and Andres, for the session. Hope yeah. you all enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.